This podcast represents the opinions of our hosts and their guests only. The content here should not be taken as medical advice and is for informational purposes only. And because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Welcome to Once Shattered, Picking Up the Pieces, a podcast devoted to changing the way eating disorders and mental illness are viewed in our society. With your hosts, Jack and Linda Major and Ellen Bennett. Today's guest is Shannon Calvert. Shannon Calvert is a lived experience educator and advisor from Australia. After experiencing more than three decades with a severe and enduring eating disorder, as well as complex physical and mental health challenges, her expertise has been working with government and non-government organizations in an advisory capacity as a peer work coordinator and trainer. She has presented papers, workshops, and training both nationally and internationally on topics such as the importance of compassion and treatment interventions, consumer and carer engagement in the design of policy and education, as well as her own lived experience. In 2019, at the International Conference for Eating Disorders, Shannon was a plenary speaker on the topic, When Does the Time Come for Compulsory Treatment? Welcome, everyone, to Once Shattered, Picking Up the Pieces, Episode 128, Severe and Enduring Eating Disorders with Shannon Calvert. Today's podcast is brought to you by two wonderful eating disorder nonprofits, The Emily Connection, and that's E-M-I-L-E-E, and KMB for Answers. I'd like to welcome my my co-hosts, my husband, my roommate, and best friend, Jack Mazur, and our dear friend and fellow eating disorder advocate, Ms. Ellen Bennett. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being with us today. And it's always great to be here with uh, my uh, wife of almost 46 years now and our dear friend, Ellen Bennett. And I feel like I've been with you for a very long time. This has been an amazing collaboration. Good morning or good Good day. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Okay, and I should add that our guest, Shannon, is also the lived experience co-production, co-lead at the Australian Eating Disorders Research and Translation Center and consumer co-chair of the National Mental Health Consumer Carer Forum. And. And that's so impressive, and and I just uh, Googled that last night and was so impressed by their, you know, creation of new partnerships, new ideas, and new research in in using lived experience in this because I I think that's just so important, and um, so thank you for all you're doing. The quote for the day certainly relates to Shannon. Your illness doesn't define you. Strength and courage does. Author unknown. Shannon and I have worked together via Zoom for about four years. Um, Last week, we met in person for the first time at the ICID conference in Washington, D.C. And it was like we had known each other forever. And this was the International Conference on Eating Disorders hosted by the Academy for Eating Disorders. So individuals attended from all over the world. Um, She is Zooming from Italy today. So you've been a world traveler for the past week or so. (laughs) Welcome, welcome. And thank you so much for all you do And for being with us, you have truly opened my eyes to um, the things that can be done and accomplished. Welcome, Shannon. We're very excited about this conversation with you, and we are looking very forward to getting to know you better. Welcome, Shannon. And uh, now you are also an Emily Connection. So we've met so many wonderful people through our journey it's, it's an absolute uh, privilege. Um, Ellen, Jack, and Linda, I'm really conscious of um, the extent and the work that you do 
um, and, and you do this sort of on a voluntary basis to support our community. So thank you so much. Um, very conscious of your, your powerful story. So to, to kind of walk alongside you in this, this next hour is an absolute privilege. So thank you. Well, we feel pretty honored and privileged yes. to have you with us today. Shannon, can you share some of your personal journey with us and with our listeners and tell us about you and your mom and how you became a lived experience advisor? Uh, sure. Well, look, I think with many of our stories, especially when um, we look at uh, long-term <clears throat> eating disorders, I think obviously it's an extensive story to say the least. Um, but I think, um, and also I'm just really conscious that some of what I may discuss um, it may be challenging for people to hear. And, and so I think it's really important that we lean into the discomfort of these conversations and do what we and breathe when we can. I think the hard conversations are really crucial for us to move forward. Um, so, so just to acknowledge that obviously, yes, my experience has been for most of my life. Um, I would say I was probably diagnosed, I want to, if I'm honest, I was probably diagnosed at the age of 13, but I think I had, um, you know, related issues way before that. Um, I always said that my eating disorder came for the ride. I don't think it was um, fundamental to my challenges with mental health. I think it was very much for me a way to um, manage a very big and complex world that I realized I couldn't fix um, and I couldn't um, manage and uh, support people that were struggling. And that was, as a highly sensitive person, that was a really uh, difficult thing for me, especially when I had complex issues in the family as well, that I realized actually I didn't have any control to support or manage those either. So I think my eating disorder over time just became a way to, I think almost to sort of make sense of what I felt was just very difficult and complex over time, and especially hitting my adolescence and also seeing people around me struggling. Um, obviously, as I as my teens progressed, um, things did get worse. We immigrated to Australia when I was 16 and I was in the trench of my eating disorders at that, eating disorder at that point, but access to care was really complex. I think it always is quite complex, but um, I was sort of getting fragmented support around care. So, I was able to convince people over time that I was doing okay, um, but I don't think there's a poster child for an eating disorder. And I think we know that's why it's so critical not to assume that someone's well because they may present physically well. Um, and so I had initially been diagnosed with anorexia nervosa, but I also experienced bulimia nervosa over time. And, um, and so when my weight was restored, I think there was this perception that I was fine. But in fact, I would say that the struggles with the bulimia nervosa were more challenging because it was more secretive. Um, it was more sort of taking me deeper down a black hole of shame. And then that was a, a huge schema, a huge core um, factor for me in terms of why I was struggling so much with, um, with my eating sort of behaviors. I continued to move forward but I think the eating disorder never left um, and I was never really recovered I just became very good at keeping it um, dormant and so no one really knew the extent of the distress I was in I did however hit a major relapse when I was in my late 20s and by a major relapse I think um, I had hit a full relapse into anorexia nervosa and um, and I did have anorexia nervosa at the binge Push type. So I think my health issues were really complex at that point. And um, I think it was then that I really struggled to come back from that. And nor did we ever think I'd come out of it. The approach to care at the time, I was looking for support and care, but it was interesting because I knew things were getting severe and I was now burning out at work. How um, old were you I at was, this point? I, was, I would say I was probably about 27, mm -hmm. 27 at that point. And things were declining rapidly. Um, and I was now starting to experience um, severe gut issues and um, and basically losing my job. And, and it was just something I was very committed to. And, um, and things were just getting so much worse, um, you know, struggling with severe depression and anxiety. It was interesting at that time, though, because I was trying to reach out for help. And uh, my uh, GP had suggested that I... Um, see a psychiatrist and I called several times 
several psychiatrists, and it was interesting how many of them said, I'm sorry, we don't do eating disorders. Mm-hmm. And, and that was a real eye-opener for me at the time. Um, there was eventually one that did see me, um, but during that time I um, suffered a, a major issue with my stomach, so I ended up having superior mesenteric artery syndrome um, and having a major life-threatening surgery at that point. So I was now in and out of hospital, and um, the psychiatrist did try to work with me, but I realized actually the more the psychiatrist was trying to work on the actual core issues, my eating disorder got worse because I think it was my way of, of trying to deal with some of the trauma and distress. However, at that, then there was one point where I was just getting worse and um, then I was placed under the Mental Health Act and the Mental Health Act is, I think, civil, same as civil commitment in the US um, or sectioning um, in other countries. I was sent to a public mental health system. The, that was probably my first exposure into the adult mental health system. Um, in Australia, we didn't have access to private care. And um, understandably, I was admitted, but there was this complexity between I was physically unwell, but this was a mental illness and no one really knew which ward to put me in. So it was my first eye opener in a very, in an adult mental health service, public mental health service that um, had a sort of a wide range of complexities. And I think that really started uh, a long journey um, towards trauma and treatment. And so even then though, I, and I just want to acknowledge that even there were some nurses there that were doing the best that they could to support and understand how to help someone with an eating disorder that hardly had anyone in the setting. And um, so there were some lovely people there, but then I was also becoming more physically unwell. And now I was a risk to the hospital and a concern to the staff. So I think my journey in this particular setting um, was in and out of the what they defined as the secure unit. And the secure unit was basically for people that had, you know, sort of very high related drug-induced psychosis that were considered unsafe. Um, I was placed into the setting, not because I was um, aggressive or... It was just more, I think, one nurse defined it. We're going to put you in here because we don't want you dying on our shift. Um, so I became yeah. sort of a, um, can I put it, a yo-yo between <clears throat> the, the hospital and the mental health setting. I did, though, have my wonderful mom by my side that entire time, and I just can't imagine the trauma that she experienced because obviously when I was in heightened distress, I would call her um, in, you know, I think there was so much that I... I said during those those moments of high anxiety and fear, um, even though I knew she couldn't help me, I think the power of a parent's voice, um, especially as your mother or father, if you're close to them, is significantly healing. And so even though with an eating disorder, it's really hard to know where your loved one's at during those really challenging times. Over the years, I remember saying to mom, I am so deeply sorry that I called you and respond and and beg you at those points in time. But I just want to reassure you that when I put that phone down, you know, the safety that you've given me over that fo- the, over the phone is one of profound, um, it's a profound healing process. And I said, I'm just so sorry, because I know on the other side of the phone, you're left wondering, what can I do under the circumstances? And, you know, that's my mom. She went through this for years. I did access... Um, Australia had now set up a, a, pub, a sort of a, well, Perth in Western Australia where I live, had set up an outpatient um, setting for people to access care. And I remember that was the first time I think I really started to get support for my eating disorder. But again, I was really unwell physically and so I kept going in and out of hospital and it was really challenging to support the consistency of care. Um, and there was no specialised care in this hospital so over the years, I chipped away at treatment. I was highly medicated, unfortunately, by the um, psychiatric hospital. Um, even though I didn't have any co-occurring or co-existing issues, they, I think for them, they thought maybe it would be an advantage because it would support me to eat more, um, but it didn't. And I think it was medication that really worked, wasn't supporting my needs. And I think there's a lot to be said um, about medication because it can be really, it can be of value, don't get me wrong. You know, the antidepressants and medication for high levels of anxiety could be really helpful. But there were other medications that probably weren't supportive to my well-being. 
Look, this happened over years, um, and I did have a psychologist that tried desperately to support my care, um, and I had a lovely dietitian, which I think is a critical part of care. But um, again, my um, I was now fragmented in a very complex system, and was now had become significantly traumatized over time. So it's never a long story short, is it? But it's a long story long. Okay. Um, probably, uh, probably I did access care. Um, I went to South Africa a couple of times. Um, mm-hmm. One time in particular was a very healing experience, but a very expensive one. Um, and so unfortunately that couldn't continue. But I um, was certainly deeply grateful for the love and care that these people provided, even though I will undoubtedly own that I was very complex and very challenging at the time. Um, When I returned to Australia, um, still wasn't in well and back into the system that I knew. And it's interesting because you become a revolving door and you almost become reliant on that process. Mm. So, um, and then unfortunately I had a couple of major seizures and then one in particular um, was when we started to, you know, my psychologist had said to my mother, as did my GP agreed, I think we need to start planning for Shannon's end of life. Um, I tried to get support so mom could be my guardian so that if something happened and there was an event, mom could make the decisions for me. That was denied. Um, So mom and I quietly um, just put some things in place, whatever that looked like. Nothing was formalized or nor did we feel safe with it. So it was towards um, the end of, I want to say, 2011, I was um, a family member called from overseas and said, there is one place that will take you. And so, of course, we debated whether that was what I wanted to do and whether that was even a good idea. But I certainly didn't want my parents to live, or my mum in particular, to live with what if I had tried this option. So I wasn't well enough to travel overseas, um, so we needed to work towards that. Eventually I was put on a plane but that experience for me was in a drug and alcohol rehab and I drug and alcohol was not a challenge or problem for me. And so again, a very um, not, they certainly had no evidence-based care or support. And so for seven months, I was, I pretty much had to call my, you know, say that I was an addict for my eating disorder and put in a very, t- a very um, traumatic experience on, in those seven months. How old were so, you? How old were you then? Um, Oh my goodness, that was, gosh, I know it wasn't, so that was in 2030. I want to say I was 36, 36 at that point. I was like a cat with no lives at that point too. Um, but I think that was probably the most traumatic just because um, it was, I think it was, they felt and their, their model, which I can understand was very effective for some people with um, strong drug and alcohol issues. An eating disorder is not an addiction. And so I think the addiction model wasn't a supportive one. I do see some of the principles and values around that. But I think for me, um, there wasn't any evidence-based care around that. There wasn't any sort of multidisciplinary support around my care. And so even though I may have gained weight and sort of been more nourished, I think it was pretty much preserving the the challenges and the burden of the eating disorder rather than actually managing that so came out of that situation and although i seemed well um i think my eating disorder was still um running riot and then again had a physical relapse in the sense that it was now becoming evident my anorexia nervosa was a problem i didn't have access to private health care and we were adamant that i was never going to go back to the system of care that I had been in for a while. And um, so I was put in place in a medical hospital under the support of the psychologist that was treating with me. And she actually didn't, she couldn't believe I was still alive at that point. We started to work really, you know, I worked really hard with her this time around. I had become more self-aware of potentially why I had this eating disorder and why I was responding in the way that I was. Could I actually manage it differently? No. But I think our approach and working alongside each other was a really supportive one. She had placed me in a medical hospital in this old, ugly hospital in Perth. And um, I was absolutely petrified. I think going into the, I think I remember thinking someone was going to come through the door with their 
you know, not that anyone's ever had a straight jacket, but it was that fear of constantly thinking I was going to kind of have this coercive form of treatment again. But it was something about this team and there was a group of nurses and a psychiatrist. And look, I wasn't easy by any means. I think, you know, I knew the more someone tried to support my eating disorder, the nastier and cooler my eating disorder got. So the more tormented I was. And so that conflict is one that was um, really difficult to think, yes, you know, I need this care. But it was their approaches to care and support that was so significantly different to how things were done before. And I think that opened my eyes to realize actually, well, we can do treatment interventions in a different way, uh, even if they're ones that have to be quite, you know, really sort of constrain the eating disorder. Even though I struggled and struggled and struggled, I think um, I think they certainly planted a powerful seed in terms of compassionate care. And um, although I was considered most definitely severe and enduring and saw there were other people in systems of care, including the private system that, that, um, that gave up on me, I think that was one of the most crucial eye-openers in saying, actually, things can be done differently. And so I started to work with the team. I didn't start to recover, but I did start to realize actually, how can I help these people do what they're so desperately trying to do in terms of people actually coming to the hospital system and accessing care? So that was probably one of the most important parts of my journey. Was that going to be my window to recovery? No, I didn't believe it was. And, um, you know, but, I was but you quite were doing sure that it. I wouldn't survive it. So you were complying with your team to help your team more than to help yourself. Yeah. That's interesting. Yes, I was. And I was shame. I was pushing my mum away at this point because I guess, you know, I'm not a mum, so nor could I ever understand what she went through. But I, I think a part of me wanted her to, you know, I was conscious of all the trauma she'd experienced with my eating disorder as well. And, um, regret to this day, put, trying to push her away and think I could independently manage all of this, um, realizing that, you know, her love was unconditional and it didn't matter how much I pushed her away from that. She was always there to care and, and love me unconditionally. So um, eventually after a couple of traumatic inst- incidences, um, one, unfortunately, I, I what nearly went back into, actually, no, I did go back into the traumatic um experiences that I had in the past and um, we were both quite betrayed by that process and my mum didn't even know that she had a right to advocate for my care because she came from a generation as when a doctor says that this is what needs to be done this is what needs to be done and you do as you're told um, it was during that time though that um, her health was starting to decline and we weren't quite sure what was going on she wasn't very good at taking care of herself and um And then sadly, sort of towards the end of 2014, after a very traumatic uh, experience in treatment, my mum was diagnosed with um, metastatic cancer. And um, I remember, you know, the impact of her diagnosis and people sort of pushing her to, you know, to say to her, you know, you'll recover from this and it'll change. And I just remember thinking at that time, that's not really fair because she's just going to want to pretend everything's okay or not and so in that moment I think the two the both of us just had this agreement of trust and dignity and respect for um, where each other was at and throughout that time I was blessed with the privilege of caring for my mum because she allowed me to and um, during that time she got worse with her cancer treatment Um, acknowledging that we knew that she wasn't going to survive it at the end of the day. I was aware of palliative care. I realized what palliative care meant. And I advocated for her right to palliative care because I knew what she wanted. So it was a very challenging, difficult process. And to get her access to palliative care, which shouldn't have been the way. Fortunately, though, when she did receive it, she, um, although she didn't live as long as we'd hoped, um, my mum's, she, I think she was diagnosed in November 2014. She passed away in April um, 2015 at home um, with her three children there. So, um, And so that was an incredible, a deeply sad 
Um, and probably, you know, people say that must have been the, the worst year of your life. And, and it certainly wasn't the worst. It was just the saddest. Um, and so people thought, oh, well, that was what made me recover. And, you know, that it turned the tables. And I said, actually, no, it wasn't at all. Um, during my mom's deepest, darkest hours, you know, we openly spoke about death and dying. We both had been in a place of believing that, that you know, I had been there and, and now mum was there. And so it was these powerful, healing, courageous conversations to explore what would end of life care look like for her, acknowledging that we had had that conversation for me as well. And I remember the one time just going and sitting next to mum and I said to her, I just want to go with you. And she said, I know you do, my girl. She said, but you're going to live. And I looked at her and I thought, how after everything that's happened, could you possibly believe that? And so I agreed with her, but I didn't really agree with her. If you know what I mean, I just thought, well, when you go, I hope it's not long until I join you. Again, that wasn't the window, but I think it was this powerful seed of holding hope for me, holding hope for me as a person and for who I was, not holding hope for my eating disorder, recovery from my eating disorder. I think my mum had unconditional love for me, similar to the compassion and support of those clinicians that I was telling you. It became more about me as a person, as an individual, rather than a person with an eating disorder. And although I struggled terribly after her death and um, I lost my family in the process, um, so I was now estranged from my siblings and the rest of my family a few months afterwards, and um, I just thought that was it. I wanted out. When I started to advocate for my palliative care rights, um, my clinician was sort of pushing the conversation. She was stalling a bit on that. I got a little bit frustrated, and that's when I said, um, all right, this is an eye for an eye. I'm gonna, if I go down, I'm taking this eating disorder with me, and I'm going to expose, excuse my language, I don't know if I can say it, but expose the bastard for what it is. And, um, and if... I keep going fine. I didn't believe I would, but I was going to do as much as I could to expose eating disorders. And then if I went down with it, at least I knew I, I did what I could. And I guess I just kept going and um, I haven't looked back. So I never expected recovery would be an option for me, but that was quite a while ago now. So, um, and that's um, my long story long. I'm so sorry. It's never a short one. <laughs> you know, this, it's just really... Um... I'm sitting here listening to you and I can relate to so many things that you're saying, you know, as a mom. And um, I'm so, um, I'm so grateful that palliative care is what turned things around for you. And, you know, we tried that for Emily and they wouldn't do it for her. So, and we were hoping just no. that sort of thing, you know, to be seen as a person and all that. But I know Jack yeah. has a question that he is going to ask you now, but that is really um, so hopeful. So hopeful. I mean, God bless. Just, and you're a miracle. Yeah. It's wonderful. I mean, just listening to your story is, is so emotional. And as I was listening, I mean, the parallels to our journey with Emily were, were so many of the same. So, so. And I'm so sorry that you were denied the right. And just to just to clarify also, I wasn't given the right to access palliative care. Um, but because I wasn't given that right, and when I explained how I understood what palliative care was, it wasn't actually that anyone was going to give up on me, that it was just purely to not ever put myself through the extent of traumatic circumstances I'd had. But then that was because that was denied or no one was open to having the conversation with me. I was incredibly frightened of my quality of life. I was frightened of uh, not having anybody around me to support my care. Although I would never ex encourage someone to recover for external, with external motivation, I think in this instance, because I was so desperately frightened of what my circumstances would be and also frightened of what circumstances could be for others, I think I was just determined to expose eating disorders and the reality to clinicians and people that were trying to understand eating disorders. If, even though I so happened to recover, which was certainly 
unexpected and honestly I don't think anyone could quite understand how that's happened. If I was given the right to access palliative care, um, I still feel then that things could be where they are now. I just don't think I would have lived in as much fear as I did. Um, and to be honest with you, if I ever became unwell again, and I I don't have that um, hanging over me, but if I knew that this was the system of care that I needed to access and the one that was significantly traumatic for me, although the system of care is changing a lot, but for me, that trauma was years and years and years of care. And so to ask somebody who's gone through that extent of it and palliative care, I think on, in around those conversations, I think ultimately we're just to say, you know, where possible, um, can I access supports that won't be punitive and won't, um, won't you know sort of support me to live in a, a, a years and years of fear again i just couldn't handle, handle that you know it's interesting you say that because you know when we talk about trauma trauma is subjective i mean a lot of people um, yeah. can go through something and and not have trauma and i know i'm going off in another um that's okay direction here but but i i'm so glad that you said trauma and treatment because in our support yeah. groups and when I hear stories about their treatment and and yeah things are getting a little better um, but that's so traumatic for them to, to especially the way they're treated especially so as adults so. you know um, who, yeah. who and I go yeah. through this all the time who have graduated from high school maybe gone to college maybe not but they have a job and maybe they have family and maybe children, and then that's all taken away from them, you know, that's trauma enough right there. And then they go into these treatment centers and, and are treated, like well, you said, pun some punitively yeah. sometimes, you know, and they make progress and then something happens and they're taken back, you know, and they're, they're punished for that yeah. as opposed to giving them credit for the progress they made, you know, and it's, everybody knows it's not a straight line. And uh, yeah. so thank you for saying that because I, I I've said that all along that just the trauma for these people in treatment is can be de devastating you know so I think we'll get to that later yeah, there needs to, to be that. some new models and we'll talk about yeah that. so yeah. you know I'm yeah. you know palliative yeah. care and hospice care is accepted in all um, disease states it, it, for end of life cancer end stage kidney disease and, and so many other things so very controversial in, in eating disorders. Very much so. And more yeah. so now than ever. So, but we are yeah. we're so grateful that, you know, at the end, Emily was placed in palliative care, we believe. No, she was placed in hospice care. Hospice care, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, palliative care enhances the quality of someone's life and, and extends their life. And um, we serve yeah. on the hospice advisory board here in, in Rochester. Hospice care is near and dear to our hearts because it does care for a person. Yeah. It keeps them comfortable. And, and it was very controversial and yeah. for Emily to be accepted in there, yeah. but we, mm -hmm. we were grateful. And we still hoped that things would turn around too. We weren't yeah. giving and, up, but and, go and ahead. They, and they thanked us for allowing them to take care of Emily because they'd never had somebody with an eating disorder. So it was yeah. a learning experience for them too. So. I think we absolutely, we've... and I yeah, I, I think just to touch on the conversation also around palliative care and and it is a contentious subject, and I'm I'm doing some work on that now, and I know that, um, you know, exploring the topic around what palliative care would mean for people with life limiting related eating disorders, um, is without fail going to uh, cause a lot of upset. But I think what I've learned having this conversation and and Jack and Linda, I mean. You know what you've gone through yourselves and i don't know if you're aware but i've actually supported a couple of because i'm trained in peer work and was as a peer worker for a couple of people and one person in particular was had to receive palliative care and by the time she received palliative care unfortunately because it was quite late in her progression um her palliative care sort of became more end of life care which i think the definitions of all of them like you said linda this was hospice i think we better be really clear about the understandings, um, people with receiving palliative care, if if put in place appropriately, um, and and there's sort of a wraparound supports, people can actually live for years. 
Right. Mm-hmm. But when someone starts to receive end of life care, then we're looking at then more towards then people have a predictable amount of time. And then, you know, then we go to the more of a terminal phase, which is now not very long to live, which is where hospice comes in. And so even the community outside of eating disorders has a misconstrued understanding of palliative care. But really what palliative care means is it for it's unique to each and every individual, but it's to actually make sure that you have the supports around you that are required to improve your quality of life until end of life, if that happens to be the case. Um, with the eating disorder center, we're not talking about everybody with an mm-hmm. eating disorder. We're, but there's some specificity. There's people like Jennifer Guardiani that have done extensive thoughtful work around this, which I know have been challenging for people. But if we really unpack that work, it's not talking about all eating disorders. It's not talking mm-hmm. about everybody with a severe enduring anorexia nervosa. It's talking about some clear understandings and definitions around that. And so it's not to give up on people at the end of the day. It's acknowledging the system of care is not going to change overnight. And we can't forget those out there who won't qualify for treatment or are considered not sick, too sick or not sick enough or kind of have had these years of uh, traumatic or punitive approaches to care, which are changing. But, you know, I just don't think we should, we can afford to forget the people whose eating disorders are so deeply entrenched and have caused physical life limiting challenges. I mean, with their org- organs are failing, the GI system is, is totally shot, you know, because of the yeah. laxative abuse and, and things. And the, the pain that Emily was in constantly daily, you know, and yeah. um, there's just, you know, again, it, it she, had tried all the systems and and, and uh, it was nothing new for nothing. her. And, and, you know, right up to the end, we thought there'd be this magical moment, you know, that she yeah. would uh, see. And, and, uh, hey, Ellen, so. you want to take it away here? Okay. <laughs> Shannon, this is a conversation that must be had, and I am so yeah. grateful that we are we have the courage to say that we need to talk about this. I'd like to shift yeah. a little bit and talk about compulsory treatment. I know you did yeah. a presentation on this topic at the 2019 International Conference for Eating Disorders. My experience with my daughter made me question why did no one mandate care? Why? Yeah. Um, it seems like the medical community just let, let her slip away, expecting her to say she wanted and needed treatment, which I now know was probably impossible for her to do. How do we engage in this conversation as well, that there may that we need to consider this. Yeah. Look, um, Ellen, I just, and, and also to, to you, Jack and Linda, I think we do absolutely have to have these courageous conversations. I think to pretend that these um, situations aren't most of our realities are not people's reality out there. Um, well, so many people and, don't understand, you know, they don't, they haven't lived it. And it, they just no. don't understand eating disorders to begin with. I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's no. that's so much of the problem no, I, is people are judging something that they don't understand. And everything we're doing, and, uh, Ellen is doing, and, and we're doing, and, and everybody, is so people don't get to this point that they get the care that they need, yeah. so they don't get to, and have to make these decisions. You know, these so. absolutely, Jack. And can I just say that I couldn't agree with you more. I wholeheartedly. Um, till the day that I die, will hold on to the fact that I hope in I'd have it many, many years away, we won't have a term severe and enduring eating disorder. But I think we ultimately have to acknowledge that at the moment, as we chip away and as we progress, um, and we are progressing in understanding um, types of care, I think the reality is is that now we need to to navigate these complex systems. And interestingly, Although I talk to trauma and treatment, I also do advocate and support the need for compulsory treatment at times. Now, there's different pathways to that. 
What I will not support, though, is when it's done in a punitive way. And so if we reflect back on many of us that have had extensive histories um, with eating disorders, unfortunately, how we understood eating disorders then, um, not actually realizing how much a person is hijacked by the eating disorder, that compulsory treatment, um, I used to I used to say, and this is my definition, and actually, a couple, I've actually worked alongside psychiatrists to um, support the process and the conversations I have with individuals and their families. If we imagined somebody um, in an abusive relationship, and this is a horrible example to, to use, but it's an honest one. And I think eating disorders are like being in an abusive relationship, right? Because you are completely um, controlled and managed by this horrible, punitious illness. Now, as much as I don't believe anybody chooses to have an eating disorder nor wants to live with an eating disorder, it is very difficult to let go of something that's become your identity. It's very difficult to let go of something that makes sense. I think even even the language that we use around eating disorders sometimes becomes a convenience because rather than going into what is the core of what's hurting and or bothering or struggle that that person's living with, we start to talk about food and body and weight. And, and so it's just so on the surface of everything. So, and then when someone comes in and says, this is what you need to do and we want to support you to heal, now this person's in torment and conflict in their head because they're so hijacked by this eating disorder. What can be incredibly helpful is when a treatment team, and I can say with some clear steps and guidance around how they have these difficult conversations, if they indeed feel that compulsory treatment is required for this person to keep them alive and keep them safe, if you think of it, it's almost like putting someone in a witness protection program <laughs> and also supporting them, supporting them safely. And so, because if we don't, what we tend to do, then what can actually happen for that person if they're at the, if they're at that position of je- of full on struggle and they've just completely hijacked is. If we leave any windows open, the eating disorder is going to f- come in. And now we're fragmenting the care and the types of supports they're getting. And so I do think that community treatment orders and the and, um, civil commitment or com- the mental health act can be a very supportive process, but not focusing on it. So basically, you know, the, the clinicians that I've spoken to have said, talk through, now this person's going to hate you. They are going to resent everything about you. They're going to resent everyone around them because of it. But where the difference lies is when you continuously communicate to that individual and their families about what's happening, you know, that it isn't always going to be the situation, that, you know, we're going to start this off for, say, five, ten days, and then we're going to review that, and then we're going to do next steps so that this person gets a window of opportunity, a chance to sort of get their brains renourished, to potentially get some support around them and then you start to chip away slowly but surely but what you do with continuing communication to both the individual and their family or approaches that are supportive in terms of language and providing dignity is you build trust what where it doesn't work well is when you say to somebody you're not doing this i'm going to punish you this way basically to say you're being placed under a mental health act because you didn't do this or you're not doing this it's a very different conversation um, to when somebody says, I think that you need someone to keep you safe. And to keep you safe right now, this is what we need to put in place, but it's not always going to be the case and this is going to be really hard, but we're going to be with you throughout that process. And you just keep going and you keep cons- and there's consistent consistence and support. And then you start to look at transitions to care over time. So. You know, there's some great psychiatrists and people that have also done um, wonderful work out there on civil commitment. And I think those that have done it in a passionate way um, have had incredible outcomes. You know, I've even um, reviewed guidelines for restraint uh, process for for young children in hospital. And, And, you know, I've even said under those circumstances, if we delay process or we traumatize someone to give them too much choice and too much overwhelm, especially when they're significantly unwell, that can be worse than ever. And so it is how we speak to each other, how we're supporting the staff to understand eating disorders. Are they being having um, supervision? Are they debriefing? 
um, you know, this is a collective process. This isn't just for one person to fix. I think teams and, and people around an individual have to come together. Um, because if I think if the staff or the workforce are, are feeling under pressured, they will respond with stress and anxiety as well. And unfortunately, it's those responses that have, um, you know, repercussions on a person's um, overall well-being. There's been studies that actually some people who have had a compassionate approach to compulsory treatment have actually understood and come back and said, you know what, I get why you did that. I hated you at the time, but it makes sense to me now. And, you know, it just goes to show that we can do that differently. That's beautifully put. And I and I love your um, comparing it to uh, an abusive uh, relationship yeah. because that's exactly what it is. So, well, there's nothing quite like peer support for whatever an individual is going through. Two of the main focuses of our nonprofit, the Emily Connection, are peer support and social connection. These are supports that help people find strength and contact connection as they continue to heal and forge their way to living their best life. People heal in communities where there is support, kindness, and compassion. What are your thoughts surrounding peer coordinator and training programs? The power of lived experience uh, across so many platforms is one that I'm, as Ellen knows, deeply passionate about. Um, the role of um, you know, we're starting to actually understand uh, when we're looking at designated lived experience positions, and those are people that fundamentally have their, their you know, their lived experience drives their role and um, and and their profession. And often those people, um, it's actually not about the individual experience, but more around how can we um, work alongside and and utilize the lived experience voice to strengthen outcomes in care and treatment. Um, and peer work is, is one of those roles that sits under that umbrella. And then you also have uh, consumer and care um, advocates and the like. The powerful thing about um, <coughs> peer work and peer support, especially when a person doing peer work has had received appropriate training and support around that, we can now sort of start to define that role as a profession. And, and my hope is moving forward that... Um, treatment, specialized treatment centers and community treatment centers will start to um, embed peer support as part of a multidisciplinary team. And again, I will just reiterate, though, I think strongly that to become a peer worker, you need appropriate training, um, just like we would expect psychologists and counselors to do the same and, and also have appropriate supervision and support by um, the team. The wonderful thing about peer work is it's about walking alongside a person. Um, it's walking with them, and uh, you know it doesn't it doesn't come in silo, nor should it ever come silo to care. It is um, a complement to the treatment and care that someone may receive. I do think it's important that sometimes a person can have relatable challenges. So, for example, I worked with a young woman. Um, and even though I was quite significantly older than her, I think she wanted me to work with her in peer work because I had had involuntary treatment and, and I actually worked through the trauma of that and I'd had a severe and enduring eating disorder. Now I may work with somebody who's in a much larger body and who's experiencing a type of eating disorder that's relatable or they may want a peer worker that relates to their lived experience even though you don't go the, down that rabbit hole of sharing trauma-related issues, you just have a trusting space of knowing that this is somebody that has walked a challenging journey that has persisted with um, support and care where appropriate and has prioritized recovery in their life, even though recovery, I would say, sometimes is a hell of a lot harder than living with an eating disorder. So I think it's it gives people hope, um, and it's a wonderful bridge of care because if you think of it, you see, you know, if a person has a um, has the best approach to care, like a really good multidisciplinary team, you see a psychologist maybe once a week, once every two weeks, and then a dietitian. And but what happens in between? You know, you go home and here's your parents dealing with the torment that you're in because you've been given a meal plan, and you know, even though you know what you need to do, the eating disorder is still coming at you left, right, and center. And so peer 
peer workers can come into that space and really gently bridge um, bridge that support and then also start to start to explore outside of the eating disorder what quality of life may look like for an individual. Um, starts to encourage the individual to not be defined by the eating disorder and to actually realize there is so much more to them than that. So I think it's an emerging space and, and it's an emerging workforce. And um, if we do it well, I think um, I think peer workers, like I said, would be a wonderful um, addition to multidisciplinary support. That's music to my ears. <laughs> Linda, you, you, and, care, you... and care and family peer workers as well. So we're actually learning, especially in Australia, we do have carer peer workers, and that's the same same thing as to actually work alongside the families that have experienced the trauma of, of, of having their loved ones um, go through an eating disorder so um, or mental health issues. Right, mm-hmm. yeah. exactly. Yeah. So are there things in Australia that they're implementing that um, have an impact and improve outcomes for people with eating disorders? Are they doing some things yeah. different? I Look, I think, yes, what I have... You know, and, and coming from the ISAID conference, I think it's it's always encouraging and to see that, and it's so difficult to believe when you're in it, but we have made some significant changes in eating disorders. I would not be sitting here talking to you if I didn't believe that we're chipping away. I might not see the perfect solution in my lifetime, but if I reflect back on the past, there are some, some incredible um, dedicated health professionals and the experience of community professionals out there. So we continue to do that. And research is a critical part of it. Um, and what I think we're also realizing that we need to actually partner uh, with people with lived and living experience to richen those outcomes from service de- design to service delivery to research in itself. Australia, where's Australia at? Look, let's, I think, and it's not just a COVID situation. I think the more we learn about a diagnosis such as eating disorders, the more it comes out of, it's almost like opening up a Pandora's box. So rather than live in the secrecy, we start to recognize actually, well, we can diagnose sooner, we can pick it up sooner. And um, so the paradox of that is more people are getting diagnosed. Um, The world's become even more complicated. And so um, we are recognizing eating disorders at at a younger age, but you know, Early intervention can't discriminate. There are people in their forties, fifties, and sixties that are that are experiencing eating disorders. So there's some significant numbers out there in the world, and we have a workforce that are desperately trying to support this, but are also fairly under resourced. So we need more peer professionals coming to the space. We need more emerging um, students and researchers stepping into eating disorders, so we can manage the divide. But also, we need GPs and um, other health professionals to be accountable that eating disorders are everyone's business that actually you know you can't pick and choose whether you can if you're a psychiatrist or a gp you will likely have someone coming through your doors with an eating disorder you don't get to turn these people away anymore we wouldn't turn someone away with cancer we wouldn't turn someone away with a broken leg so um eating disorders are pretty much now i think they need to be everyone's business in australia again uh a very under-resourced space, although government is now starting to um, implement process because we're realizing the numbers are increasing significantly, especially amongst young people. There are a lot of, um, well, not a lot of, there are some specialized um, treatment centers, but again, the workforce at the moment is quite burnt out, especially since COVID. And I think that's just across the world. I think what we need to do is start to understand that people aren't um, people are wonderful, complex, messy human beings, and that there are people out there with coexisting issues. So, for example, they have an eating disorder, but they may have something else. They may have bipolar. They may have an addiction. And so, what we really need to start exploring is what are people's pathways and transitions between care. So, for example, we just want to specialize care for someone with an eating disorder. We can't expect them to say, you know, you fit in this box for a while and then when we feel that you've uh, met those you know the requirements to come out of that box then off you go and find another box but you know either way we're trying to sort of put square pegs and round holes and I don't think that's a fair approach so we need to look at more collaborative approaches and mechanisms to support people out there in the community 
um, so potentially people won't actually have to go into inpatient care or become so unwell. So, um, and then if people are really unwell and they're in hospital, what is their transition outside of hospital going to look like? You know, let's not have that conversation at the start of someone going in hospital rather than at the end of, of their treatment. So that can we really set up these really crucial pathways and it is doable. Yes, and so you know, often it falls apart if it's not orchestrated, right? You know, it's the follow-up. <clears throat> it's knowing that people care if you don't show up for your scheduled appointment and the follow-through. And, you know, it takes very special people to work with anyone who has mental illness, certainly eating disorders. It's, yeah. it's you know, it, it is a mental illness and mm. people can recover, but it takes... It takes a village, well, and it ta- and I and I think, you know, sitting around this table, Ellen, you know, Katie knew how much you loved her, and you were with her every step of the way. We were with Emily every step of the way, and Shannon, you know, your mother, you know, you were there for her, and you know, she was there for you, and um, yeah, you know, the love was there, and um, and if love was enough, it would always work out just right. So, but at least that's um something that is cathartic for us moving forward that that we had that not everybody has that so yeah it's it's interesting um there's i know we've got to move on this will be quick <laughs> she's always <laughs> telling me to move on but <laughs> now when you talked about you know people um and wellness there's this big push now for wellness to, because of you know the staffing in hospitals um and well, and the lack of staffing in nursing homes in this country. And so there's this big push for wellness, especially in the elderly people to keep them out of the hospital yeah. and because there's no place for them to go. And so there's, there's, all and that's, these, a, that's a good thing. It's a great thing. Yeah, oh, it, it is a great thing. Yeah. Um, so, but there is mainly focused on the elderly people here right now anyway. Yeah. And so they're, they're buying and you know, there's all these doctors groups and stuff that are, sending people into people's homes now, nurses and doctors and pharmacists into people's homes to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and, and nutritionists to make sure they're eating, you know, yeah. eating, eating meals and everything. So why not do that for somebody with an eating disorder or, you know, and, or Jack, mental Jack, illness? you know what the interesting thing, I think we have to think strategically. You're, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's rather than siloing what we feel we need to do in eating disorders or we need to do in aged care or you look at the models that are working really well look at the ones that are great that are actually thinking you know there's an effective approach to this type of support and how can we apply that adapt it and do it for eating disorders in particular rather than feeling it is one size fits all we're, we're learning that people are this beautiful tapestry and that what we knew was just cbte alone or bbt now we actually can get pick and choose and and kind of you know, create this wonderful tapestry around this person, their families and supports. But we've got to look at the models that are effective, that have worked really well in the system and adapt them for eating disorders, especially with what we do. And then that way we capacity build the, the you know, the workforce. We capacity build specialized care so we're not just looking at psychologists to to treat it. Uh, it is critical. Um, people have dietitians, but, you know, social workers do amazing work. So do OTs, uh, occupational therapists. And the, so I think and these things it's about will, thinking really strategically. And these things will save money in the yeah. long run. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. But if you don't mind, Ellen um, and Jack and Linda, and um, I think if, if anything, and I think this is what I, I did want to share with you all, and Ellen and I had this conversation. I mean, our connection um, and our, our colleague Kim, who who lost her loved one, for, um, and she was her sister. It was her sister, and um, we've managed to find this incredible connection. And also reflecting on on your experiences as well, I acknowledge I'm in this wonderful place of privilege to have survived my eating disorder. But I have lost my mum, and um, there is so much that I wish I had said to her. Um, and so now I guess I'm in this wonderful position to share this with the people that, especially those those parents that are currently supporting their loved one, but also for people like you that, although this was not your journey, this was not your daughter's journey, um, I can wholeheartedly say 
that throughout our, our experiences with this nightmare of an illness, I don't think was there ever a moment that we would ever blame our loved ones and our parents because it is not your fault, nor was it ever. And I don't think there was ever a moment where I didn't doubt how much my mum would have done and given anything to me. When I say, um, when I talk to people about holding hope, holding hope comes from unconditional love and support. Holding hope comes from believing that um, there is a person there that even though hijacked by the eating disorder, there is a person there that we love um, and, and we love dearly and that we know will exist regardless of what the outcome is. But the most critical thing I would say for yourselves or anyone moving forward is as much as our loved ones, or no, I couldn't say to my mum how deeply grateful I, I was and how she planted a seed for me every single day. Um, I never wanted her to fix the situation. I was so grateful that she held my hand and um, you can't beat love like that. So, you know, I can't tell mum how deeply grateful I am and how I could never have done life without her. But if I can tell you that, then I, I think we will do some incredible work together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Emily told me, you know, and as a dad, I always say, I'm supposed to fix things. Your dads are supposed to fix things. And, you know, I remember Emily, you know, when she was in hospice care, just saying, you know, Dad, there's nothing more you could have done this. You know, it had to be me. So. Yeah. And, um, and well, I think they've somehow, I don't know, I was saving this conversation with Ellen, and I don't know how the universe works. I have to believe, and I will continue to believe that we'll see them again. Yeah. And, um, and I also believe that somehow, isn't it, you know, isn't it wonderful that maybe they're having some control over this situation and we found each other. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. From, from yes. other sides of the world. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we've reached, we've had connections from Great Britain and New Zealand. Uh, Christy Amadeo was doing great work in New Zealand. So, all right, I know. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to skip my last question and just kind of say, in summary, these conversations have to happen. We cannot shut down a conversation because um, we absolutely don't agree. Because how we become more compassionate and more understanding is by sharing these thoughts and considerations. Because change is happening. And we are chipping away, as you have so beautifully said bef throughout this conversation. But we need to continue to chip away. We need to continue to challenge um, that we can do better. And we need to do more. And it needs to happen. One of the comments at the conference was that for research to be, um, to be delivered and become live and active in practice takes 17 years. years. Yeah. That was terrifying yeah. for me. We, uh, what I will say is we know we don't have that time. We have to really look, as you said, Shannon, look at what's working. Right. Have the difficult conversations. Talk about it because eating disorders and mental health issues are so complex and multidimensional that we have to think that way. I was I was thinking, you know, uh, Ellen knows that I talk about insurance because it's all about insurance and what they what they cover. I mean, they're the ultimate uh, final answer, you know. And uh, as we were as we're recording this, I thought, and there's other recordings we've done in the last three years that I thought I could just go to an insurance company and say, listen to this, listen to this person with lived experience and live, listen to what they think works and what they need. They know the changes that have to be made and everything. And so it's just, you know, and I looked up, you know, the dollars for research in Australia and, it, and it's very similar here. The, the eating disorders get 
pennies on a dollar versus, you know, schizophrenia. And I'm not this, you know, all mental illnesses. Schizophrenia is, is, is very a terrible disease, but to get hundreds of times the dollar for research in that. And then I, I did see that uh, from, it was a, a doctor out of uh, Canada, Federici, right? Who talked about, you know, all this research that's on this proven stuff. And then it, take 17 years to, to disseminate down and Cindy Bullock's doing all this great research. And so we, yeah, for it to become evidence-based, but you yeah. know, we have to use some common sense common, here. Yeah. We have to use some common sense. And as Einstein said, oh. common sense isn't that common. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I was going to say, and I know this is terrible because isn't it because there's so much to talk about, but if you need to go back to those insurance companies, ask them if your child or your loved one was diagnosed with cancer, would you sit back and a doctor said, look, um, we know they have cancer, but we're going to pause on you having chemotherapy for six months because, you know, um, would we actually sit back and allow that to happen? Or if our loved one had cancer and we're receiving life-saving treatment like chemo, would we just stop, yeah. stop mm-hmm. halfway through because actually, I'm sorry, but we, you know, we can't, we can't support this process. And it is just as severe and it's just as serious, if not worse sometimes. It is no different. This isn't something people pick and choose whether they have or have not. And I think ultimately at the end of the day, having the hard conversations or having healing conversations as well. I think it's this, these challenging conversations that will ultimately support all of us to heal and hopefully support the system to heal and do better as well. Yeah, there's people in our support group that said, you know, they, they wish they had cancer because then they would have got the treatment they, they, they needed in a continuum of care and, you know. Yeah. Um, well, and and I think, you know, having each lost a child, uh, an adult child to anorexia, um, we're traumatized. The powerlessness and all the things that, you know, we tried and, you know, how the system failed us. We're traumatized by this, too. And, um, and people don't realize that, you know, people don't realize what the families go through. So we have to do better as a community because um, our children are our future, right? If it's your spouse, yeah. if it's your sister, it doesn't matter. You know, they deserve to be cared for and have the best treatment available for their illness, right? We are a civilized yeah. society. We don't, you shouldn't be picking and choosing what people get. And yeah, I would love it if people didn't have to go to residential treatment and they could heal in their communities because we were better and more educated um, as the community. Uh, that's, that's, um, that would be great. You know, like you said, this has been wonderful. Yeah, I know our time is up. We could go on for hours here. And, uh, <laughs> we really could. Yeah. So, um, but thank you but so much. Thank Shannon. you so much. And you know, part of, part of doing this yeah, is, thank you. Ellen's story is one story. Our story is another story. Everybody has a story out there, and I'm trying to get people to reach out and come together with all these stories because one story might not be powerful for an insurance company, but a multitude of stories are. We'll story them. (laughs) And from from clinicians, because everybody's frustrated, clinicians and, and... and parents, and, and so not just people that have lost somebody, but people that are still in struggling and not getting the care they need. So I'm, I'm hoping the people listen to these that, that reach hey, out and come together. Well, storm them with stories. How's that? Yeah, storm them, storm them with stories. Them with stories. And, and also, we have the solutions. We're actually coming with it and solutions. Yeah. We're actually providing a solutions focused approach to this. How wonderful. Yeah. So we're actually backing up that actually, you know, we've got some ideas on how things can be done differently rather than telling them all what's wrong. We're actually going, hey, yeah. you know, we've got the ideas. We've got the ways that you can save money and that you can implement this and put it in place. Can't get better advocacy than that. No. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. We're re- <laughs> we are focused on helping solve the issues. We're not, we're... We're, we're experienced, we're traumatized, but we are so solution focused and that's a really important aspect. So I don't, I don't know at these conferences, but they ever send, um, to insurance companies to attend, you know, invitations to insurance companies. They run. 
well, but you know, <laughs> away. You no, know. we'll have to hold some people hostage <laughs> at a conference <laughs> because they're the ones that need to listen. You know, everybody in the room gets it. Everybody yeah. at these conferences gets it. You know, everybody that heard our story at the media conference, they got it. You know, and they. But um, I don't know. I, I guess I don't know who we go to politicians. Uh, I don't yeah. know who to go to to. So, you know, if you send an invitation and it's denied, then, you know, go to the press and say, well, why did you, why wouldn't you send somebody to this conference? Why wouldn't you want to learn more about, you know, eating disorders? So I'm, I'm, I'm yes, that's a podcast to podcast number two, systemic advocacy. Very happy to have that conversation. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. 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 we're signing you up. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much. Shannon. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy your time in Italy. It's a, it's a wonderful country. Oh, yeah. Thank you all so much. And you just take care. Please go gently. Um, Look forward to I meeting you, you in person you. someday. Yeah. Oh, likewise. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao. Love yeah. you See much. You okay. See thank you. you. Rock Vox See recording you. and production. And th- we, we, did you want to say something out, Shannon? No. I'm out. No, just, just okay, go I'm gently sorry. and thank you so much for your care. I'll be out there. And I'll wave goodbye. Take care. Thank, thank you. you so much. This has been great. Thank you, Rock Fox Recording and Production. And thank you, sound engineer and producer Scott Fitzgerald for expertly producing our co- podcast and so much more. Help us continue the conversations. Please rate, review, share, and subscribe to Once Shattered on the podcast platform that you are listening to us on now. Tell your friends and family about us. Start the conversation. Please reach out if you are so moved. And remember, Rockbox is the place to record your podcast, record your audiobook, or do a legacy cast for your loved ones. Thank you, everyone, for listening.